Shabbat Shalom. Good morning, everyone. I'm Rabbi Jenny Greenspan here for Congregation Beth El Zedek in Indianapolis. Um, I'm so glad to have uh, our weekly opportunity for a little bit of uh, Torah talk, as we call it, our Shabbat morning Torah learning on the, our Torah portion for the week. This week, we will be reading from the Torah portion, Shlach Lecha, Send for Yourself. Uh, so we'll take a look at that together. If you would like to follow along with a PDF of our Etz Chaim Chumash, you can go to bez613.org and select the virtual Shabbat resources and scroll on down to where it says Torah Talk, and there is an Etz Chaim link right there. If you are, uh, if you have a physical copy of Etz Chaim at home, feel free to grab it as well, um, or any other Chumash. Um, but for now, I say Shabbat Shalom and good morning. I'm many to already welcome in to our little virtual space here. Uh, Shabbat Shalom and welcome to James Roth, to Jody Zucker, to the Seagulls and the Sclares. Shabbat Shalom, morning to Ray, uh, Shabbat Shalom, good morning to Renee Fout, Ellen Hamburger, Michael Kahn, Phyllis Luger, Peter Meyer, and Jim Hannons back in Muncie this week. Okay, so Shabbat Shalom. Good morning. Welcome. So good to see so many already joining this morning. Uh, and as I said, you can access a PDF of our Torah portion on the Bethel Zedek website, bez613.org. Uh, just go to the virtual Shabbat uh, next to uh, Torah Talk. We'll say it's Chaim. If you have a physical copy, you can join me either in the PDF or the physical copy on page 843. Uh, or if you are using a different edition of a Humash, I am in Numbers chapter 13, and I'm going to begin at verse 20, verse 25, excuse me. And we'll go for a little bit today uh, in this story. So today, rather than one particular verse, uh, I actually want to focus on the story of this week's Torah portion. And so as I mentioned, this portion is called Shlach Lecha which means send for yourselves based on the opening verse of the Torah portion where the um, where God speaks to Moses and says, send for yourself a scout, sometimes translated as a spy, but scout is probably the better uh, um, intentional translation. Um, one from each tribe. So we'll have a total of 12 scouts who are to go from Paran, where the community is kind of gathered and settled, and they're actually going to get into the land of Israel. By the way, the tradition says that this is only about a year into their time in the wilderness after leaving uh, Egypt. We are used to hearing 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, wandering in the desert. And here they are a year in and able to send scouts into the land. They are that close. So the story of this Torah portion is also going to answer the question of why is it going to take them another 39 years? Uh, it's uh, Carol Steinfeld, Shabbat Shalom and welcome, but also it's kind of a, an interesting um, coincidence of thinking about this in the terms of 40 years ago with a, a, with a bat mitzvah, um, such a, and it's a good parsha. And now we're thinking, why did it take another 39 years? We could only be one year and there. They could have gotten from Egypt to the land of Israel in one year and done. Uh, and the uh, and so Moses sets up. We have a list at the beginning of the Torah portion, uh, the name of each of the scouts who head into the land of Israel, who discover the beauty of the land, the beauty of the fruits. That there, it's said that there are massive grapes, uh, grapes such that to carry one bunch would take two people lifting on their shoulders. Um, it's become quite an iconic image, and this. The, and they see that they're to go see this land flowing with milk and honey, and they see that it is indeed every bit a wonderful land that God has promised to the people. And they don't all come back with the completely positive response. We often think of, and if you've heard this story before, um, we often think of 10 and 2 of these 12, these 12 uh, scouts or spies often think of 10 and 2, with the 2 being Joshua and Caleb. So I want us to read the story for a moment, um, because I think that if we look in context, uh, Caleb is always in the positive column, and there are 10 who are always in the, okay, maybe we're not ready for this column. But Joshua actually goes through a slightly different journey, and I want us to follow him for a moment. So join with me on, in the text, in Numbers chapter 13, verse 25. 
If you're in an Etz Chaim, it's the very first verse on page 843. At the end of 40 days, they returned from scouting the land. They went straight to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran, and they made their report to them and to the whole community uh, as they showed them the fruit of the land. This is what they, the scouts, told him, Moses. We came to the land that you sent us to. It does indeed flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. However, the people who inhabit the country are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the Anakites there. Amalekites dwell in the Negev region. Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites inhabit the hill country, and Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. I'm a little bit distressed here. Caleb hushed the people before Moses and said, let us by all means go and we shall gain possession of it for we shall surely overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we cannot attack that people for it is stronger than we. Thus they spread communities along the Israelites, thus they spread uh, calamities on, along the Israelites about the land that they had scouted saying the country we have traversed and scouted is the one that devours, is one that devours its settlers. All the people that we saw in it are men of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. The Anakites are part of the Nephilim. And we looked like grasshoppers to ourselves. And so we must have looked to them. This little, this uh, closing verse, a very uh, famous verse of thinking about when we ourselves think of ourselves less, we assume that others think of us as less. And here we have the men. It actually does not isolate Joshua here. Only, only Caleb is isolated as saying, we can handle this. We can do it. And the others, the rest of the men, these scouts, say, we can't. We're not good enough. We're not going to make it. And spreads calamities. Spreads despair. We're reminded here multiple times at the beginning of this passage that these Scouts are speaking not just to Moses and Aaron, the leaders, but they are sharing this report in front of everyone in the community. And it ends up causing despair. We recognize it, there's, this story is a moment where we recognize that despair can be contagious and that if we think of ourselves as grasshoppers, we will not go anywhere. The whole community, I'm going to continue here, the whole community broke into loud cries and the people wept that night. All of the Israelites railed against Moses and Aaron. If only we had died in the land of Egypt, the whole community shouted at them. Or if we might die in the, or if only we might die in the wilderness. Why is God taking us into that land to fall by the sword? Why is God setting them up for, us up for violence? Our wives and children will be carried off. It would be better for us to just go back to Egypt. I think it would be better to go back to slavery than to face the challenge in front of them. And they said to one another, let us, let us head back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembled congregation of Israelites, and Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Yephunneh, of those who had scouted the land, rent their clothes, and exhorted the whole Israelite community. The land that we traversed and scouted is, exceed, is an exceedingly good land. God is pleased with us. God will bring us into that land, a land that flows with milk and honey, and give it to us. Only you must not rebel against God. Have no fears then of the people in the country, for they are our prey. Their protection has departed from them, but God is with us. Have no fear. The particulars of what is said there, the, the violence and the we're ready for war, they are getting ready for war. They are intending to invade a land. But notice that now Joshua has entered the picture on Caleb's side. In the previous passage, at the end of chapter 13, it looked as though Joshua may have been a part of the rest of the group, the men, the other scouts. And now, after he has seen the despair that the entire community picks up, catches from the, group, the rest of the scouts, and has heard one person say that there's hope and there's something that we can do, Joshua has made the choice to shift from a space of despair, a space of wanting what's in front of him in a space of saying, yeah, it's greener on the other side, but we're not gonna get there. I'm just a grasshopper. We're all just grasshoppers. Joshua instead says, okay, I see someone else has some courage and I'm going to take that on. I'm gonna choose for hope and for courage to be what I take away from this 
rather than despair, being what I take from this. And, I, and it is worth noting that Joshua is of these two, Joshua, not Caleb, who was had the faith and the hope and the courage the whole time. It is Joshua who learns and takes on hope and courage, who, be, to be, who becomes the next leader. It is Joshua who will take over for Moses when Moses dies and the people enter into the land, which we'll actually see in the Hot Torah today. It is Joshua who becomes the next leader. And I think we therefore learn from Joshua in these two tellings of how this report came back to the people, we learn that sometimes we have to learn hope. We have to be willing to con be convinced that something better is possible. And we have to be willing to take the leap. We have to be willing to take the chance. Right now, what we are living through a time of seeing glimmers of change. And we are living with long-term trauma and despair. Most of us have felt some level of trauma in the last 15 months of living through a pandemic. And as things, as restrictions start to lift and things start to reopen, we're not quite sure if the land outside is yet flowing with milk and honey. We're ready to yet go back out. Some of us may be starting, if we are fully vaccinated, maybe starting to be willing to go at least outside in public without our masks. And some of us still recognize that for a long time, that little piece of fabric or paper was the only defense we had, and we're maybe not quite ready to give it up, even if we've been told that it's safe to do so. We're not quite ready to trust that hope. Some of us, it might be we're ready for that, but we're not quite ready to trust the hope to be able to travel. Some of us may not quite feel ready to trust in the vaccine itself, may be hesitant into what it might do to our bodies. For all of us in, those, in these situations, it's time to figure out, is there a Caleb around? There's someone else who already has a little bit of hope, who already says, let's take the step that I can lean on, that I can ask for help and ask for guidance. How can we be Joshua? How can we see the minority that is hopeful and ask for help to take a step toward hope. I'm not saying we have to be ready to go back out, um, but perhaps if we are hesitant, we might be able to say, weigh what bits of this is my own despair and what bits of this are truly something I'm not quite ready for. And it may not be pandemic related for some, sometimes the, uh, the leap that we might need to take has to do with our work. If we're in a less than ideal work situation, it might be a relationship next step. Perhaps we need to end a bad relationship or make the next step uh, in a good one. Whatever it might be, often in life, we have moments where we know what should come next. And we know that it would be great if we could take the step. And too often, we're the 10 spies, who, 10 scouts whose minds can't be changed, who say, it would be great. It really would, but I'm a grasshopper and I can't handle it. So I hope that we can find the ways, whatever challenges we might be facing, find the ways to instead, not necessarily expect ourselves to be Caleb, be ready to be just, yep, I can do it, gung-ho, but be ready to be Joshua. Maybe we can find the ways to say, maybe someone else can help guide me toward hope. And maybe if I find a friend, I can take that next step. And in having that courage, the courage and the willingness to change our minds, to take on hope and to resist despair that we are feeling, maybe through that we might actually merit becoming the next leader, merit becoming the next person who will carry all of us and be the person that others can look to for that hope and for that next step. So say Shabbat Shalom. Thank you so much for joining me. I wish us a week of figuring out how to be Joshua and a week of finding our own Caleb who can help us grow in our own courage for whatever it is in our lives that we need uh, for whatever next step we're uh, not quite ready, but think it might be time for. I'll say Shabbat Shalom. Thank you for joining me. Uh, Shabbat Shalom. Also, I noticed uh, Marty Lip and Tim Margo May and Julia Whitehead. Thank you for joining me. Um, and it's so good to, to see all of you. I look forward to uh, seeing you. Um, more literally soon uh, as we also figure out our next steps. 
the Shabbat Shalom, please join us on the live stream. Just be easy, 613.org slash watch live, uh, where you will find us on the chapel in the chapel at 10 o'clock this morning. Shabbat Shalom, and I will see you soon.